we don't have, uh, don't have to let it count all the way down. Um, this is it's time to get started. <laughs> so let me kill the music um, and say good morning and welcome to my live stream. Thank you for watching. Um, and if you're in my class, thank you for saying hello in Discord so that I can see you're here. Um, this is a live stream for section two of electronic literature, a, a class at uh, the University of Mary Washington, and this is my live streamed lecture for that class. So, good morning. Um, I'm giving that extended introduction because I um, have picked up a lot of new subscribers on YouTube who might be seeing this and might be confused. Um, I, I had a video get a lot of views over the past few days for some reason, and so uh, a lot of them, I've also been getting a lot of subscribers who hope, I guess are hoping for some, for more content like that. Um, I do have more content like that, but um, most of my content is stuff like this, which is me lecturing for my class. So, um, yeah, there you go. Uh, I was, the the video is just a it's a supercut video uh, that I did using some software called Video Grep, and it's a supercut of just breathing sounds from a one of the presidential debates from last year, and um, kind of random, kind of funny. I don't know, not my favorite thing of the, of that genre that I've done, but pretty good, I guess, and. Um, it's got it's almost fifty thousand views, which is crazy for me. So, you know, thanks for watching those, I guess. <laughs> so the uh, yeah, so today I'm going to be talking about something. Uh, I have a lecture, and this is actually going to end up being basically part one of two, uh, at least two. Uh, and then this is a topic that is um, I think not covered that much in the electronic literature textbook, and it is something that I happen to know a bit about, and so I thought it would make sense for me to basically teach it or explain it to you, as opposed to asking you all to read. Uh, about it first. So let me pull up my slides and show you what I'm talking about. Uh, let me do this. There it is. All right, cool. So here's the, let me, <laughs> am I fixed? No. Uh, not really. Okay, so let me, let me adjust a few things here on my, my view. All right, here we are. So here's the topic, uh, computer-generated books. We're going to be talking about these today. I'm, I'm going to be talking about these. You can talk about them too, but I won't hear you because um, this is a live stream and this is one way. But you know, if, I hope, certainly hope if you have questions or comments, uh, please leave them either in the Twitch chat or the Discord chat. I'll see those. I, I do not have the YouTube chat pulled up. So if you do leave anything there, I won't see it. Um, so I, I guess I can see it later, but I have not actually ever gone back and looked at those later. So I don't know if I ever get any of those. Uh, probably not. Anyway, so this is um, computer generated books. That's what, that's what I'm talking about today. Uh, I did share the slides earlier in Discord, but I'll go ahead and do that again, I guess. Um, there are There's a lot of information in these slides, so, uh, so here's some stuff here. So just to, in the, just to kind of orient you within this class, last week we talked about kinetic poetry and uh, interact kinetic and interactive poetry. We looked at a lot of examples and Friday we had an interesting experience uh, collectively reading um, or chorally reading Agrippa, a book of the dead by William Gibson. Uh, really interesting experience and I want to talk to you all or hear, your, hear your thoughts about that experience. Um, so we'll talk about that some on Wednesday I guess so you'll have to kind of think back to Friday. But this is actually kind of building off of that a little bit because today computer generated books I think I would include Agrippa in that sense of like books with computationally generated content in them which is what we're um what i'm what i'm going to be talking about today uh, okay so a few other things though let me go to this view of it um a few things so this is uh i guess i could have organized this differently but this is a an odd week for the schedule this is week 13 of the semester so that means i'll see the odd cohorts in person tomorrow um you know room 329 usual drill for that in fact this will be our last meeting as a cohort um so you know, come on out, I guess, and, and your last chance to talk in person. I mean, the class will continue, but uh, this will be your last chance to attend in person if you're in the odd cohorts. Uh, so I guess take advantage of that. Um, the uh, That's the same deal. Everyone else, you'll be on Zoom like usual. And I will be doing a bit more lecture than I usually do on those days because I, I do have more to say about computer generated books that I'm, I'm going to have to do on Wednesday because I, I won't have time today. But you'll see what I mean when I get there. and It'll be fine, I hope. Uh, the other thing I wanted to mention is for Wikipedians. So if you are completing the Wikipedia option for the final project, then I'm, I've got two optional workshops scheduled. Um, I, these are optional in the sense that, like, I mean, I hope you attend, but I didn't ask ahead of time to see when people were available. So I just kind of picked two times, one kind of morning, one in the afternoon, in the hope that, you know, a number of you can attend at least one of those, uh, maybe both. And uh, I, it just, I, it's, um, uh, it'll just be a Zoom thing. and. We will kind of go through the, the different things that 
you all are working on and, and different strategies, different research, you know, whatever you need uh, in order to to be successful with these things. Um, and, and I'll just uh, send the Zoom link through Canvas, so uh, it'll go out to everybody. But of course, if you're a Wikipedian, I'm especially hoping you will be able to attend one of these uh, sessions. Um, also, if you'll remember, I am going to try to assign you a specific person to write an article for, to be the like the point person on that article. And so I'm going to try to get those assignments figured out tonight. So if you have, I'll, I'll look back over your proposals to see if there were any really strong preferences, but I will, and, I, and if so, I will certainly try to honor those. Um, or if you have a strong preference that you would like to express now, you know, let me know. So I can uh, try to put you in, give you, uh, let you work with someone who you want to work on. Um, but that, the, the idea will be essentially that each person will um, be assigned to a particular person and you will be the kind of original author of that article, but then you will get help from other people um, after, the, after that article has been created. And yes, yeah, so uh, Savannah, all the Zoom calls are recorded. So they are, um, I mean, that, that happens automatically in Canvas. Um, so you can find it if you go to the Zoom tab uh, in the navigation for Canvas. And then I, actually I can just show you because I'm, I'm logged in right here, I think. So the Zoom tab down here and then uh, the cloud recordings and there should all be available here. Um, th sometimes this, let me actually show you this because this is a little weird, I think. Um, this is worth showing. So when you click on, let's say you want to look at the recording from Friday, it's here, but then just like, well, I want to see it. But like, if you click play, there is a passcode, but it's kind of hard to see. Like it actually did copy that to my clipboard. So if I go here and then hit paste, that it'll, it'll paste and then, then I can watch it in the cloud right here. It also appears down below. So if you click on the eyeball button, that thing, it'll actually show you the passcode for that recording. So that's also what you need. Or you can click that to copy it to your clipboard. I don't know why they hide it like that, but it is there. It's just not like, immediately obvious that it's there so I don't know um, but that's that's how you can access those if you have any issues uh, you can let me know um, all right so the other thing is um, I, think I lost my clicked on the wrong there we go um, so yeah if, if you can't attend either of the workshops but you still want to talk about it then you can set up a time that works for you and we can kind of look at it together um, you know zoom is uh, good if it's a group but i also use that whereby tool you can schedule an appointment with me on my website zachwayland.net slash contact and i'd be happy to discuss the wiki whatever you're working on with the wikipedia stuff or anything else um i wanted to show you this actually because i did something i did actually uh i made a new account um i noticed when i was showing you all this the other day that it does actually recommend using an anonymous new username or a pseudonym and I had originally created an account with just Zach Whalen, and you know I don't really mind my identity being public, but I, I also kind of, I don't know, maybe I don't know, it doesn't have to be. So I actually went ahead and made a, a, a pseudonym account um, more recently. And if you, I mean, it's up to you, right? But you just notice that it's saying like, if it's, an, if it's your actual name, it'll appear on the edit history for any articles that you contribute to. So you, know, you have to be okay with that basically. Um, with that new account, I've started making a few edits. The, uh, let's see, where'd it go? Oh yeah, I was gonna show you this one because I, um, I made an edit to this page, but um, it got reverted, meaning someone did not accept my edit, basically they, they um, deleted it. So, uh, and, I, and I see why. So this was, so Brood X of Cicada, of the periodical cicadas, it's coming out in a couple weeks, three weeks. I don't know how, when they're gonna come out, they, they all come out at once. Um, the, um, yeah, I will. Yeah, I'll, I'll definitely send an announcement, Bobby, through Canvas when, uh, when those happen. Um, and so I, Brood X actually has a couple of um, references in popular culture, and I knew of one, and so I added it here, um, but it was reverted because I did not add a citation for it. So I can show you that, what I added, and then if you look at it, so my name is Molecule, 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 and if I click there, you can see you can compare. So Corker1 is someone who's obviously been editing this doc, this page a lot. And so they must have noticed my my change. And I'll show you what I added. So I added this line here. I think the phrasing is a little awkward of how I wrote that. But basically what I should do is actually include the full citation to this graphic novel um, as opposed to just mentioning it here. And so that's, I didn't. And so 
Um, the next, did I go to the next edit from here? Oh, neat. Um, oh, this is cool. Okay, well, I'll play this later. But uh, basically, Corker 1 um, deleted my edit. So, um, so if you look at it there, they left this note. Um, new information lacked citation to source. So, okay, you know, that's, that's fine. I can, I can add that later. So that's the, the kind of thing that you always have to do when you're doing this, when you're working on an existing article, especially one that has a lot of attention on it right now, like Brutex, which is, um, you know, significant because it's about to come out. Yeah. Yeah, they, I've been really interested in, in it too, Tara. Like, I, I, just, I think they're cool, so I can't wait. I actually learned that there's actually three different species of periodic cicadas in Brutex. So, um, and they, they're, they look pretty similar, but um, slightly different sizes and head shapes and stuff. But um, I just I think it's fascinating that they've, they, they've, they live this life every 17 years together, but they're actually separate species. Uh, they don't, you know, mate or anything in between each other, but they just happen to kind of cohabitate, I guess. It's just it's really fascinating to me. Um, yeah, it's, it can be intense though. I, I, but what remains to be seen is like, I don't know how much of an emergence we'll have here in Fredericksburg. Um, it's looking at the maps, it's kind of hard to tell. Um, brood two, I think it was brood two. Yeah, brood two in 2013 was really big around here. And that was fascinating. Um, and I look forward to it again, but um, brood X, I, I don't, I, I've not been in Fredericksburg for brood X before. So we'll see. All right. Yeah, it's really just there everywhere all of a sudden, and then all of a sudden they're not, and it's it's really interesting. Um, okay, so let's uh, let me move on. Let me talk a little bit about computer generated books because that's the topic today, and I want to get through a lot. I have a lot to say about it. Um, and uh, but if you have questions about anything else, of course, feel free to <laughs> continue uh, discussing Brutex. Um, but this is uh, what we're talking about today: computer generated prose or computer generated books. Um, there is a little bit of slippage between these two terms in the sense that I'm kind of talking about both um, and they are not necessarily the same thing, right? So there are computer generated books that are poetry and there is computer generated prose that's not published in book form. Um, but, you know, the, more or less, there's a particular set of things that I'm interested in here when I talk about computer generated books. And usually I mean, I mean things like this. I mean, I'm, I'm of course interested in, in kind of privileging books that have actually been printed, but a book doesn't have to be printed in order to be a book. And certainly some of the examples that I'll show later on in the talk here are um, PDFs. I mean, that's, that's the only uh, version that exists. This is a book of, uh, generated by a computer program written by Nick Montfort, and then it uh, was published as a book. So these are the kinds of things that mainly I'm talking about. But if we're looking for a really generic definition, I think this is good enough. Uh, we're talking about text that's composed as a result of execu executing a computer program. I think this is, a, this is a start for a definition. I feel like I want to... Um, beef that up a little bit, but I think it's you know decent basically to get the idea that we're talking about uh, a computer doing something, and then the the result is a book. And so um, what it does is always the interesting part. And there's you know uh, composition is the word I'm using here, but there's also like you know generation of course is a word, and that has all these interesting layers to it. And then there's like you know writing or uh, selecting or arranging, and um, you know there's so many different ways we could think of that action or the, the give a name to the thing that the computer does but basically it's a it's a program or something designed by a, a human that results in this i think that that's what we're interested in so um like anything else whenever we come up with a definition we can start looking for um kind of uh, parameters like when was the first one of these of this kind of thing and what are some outliers and how do we kind of understand this the shape of this as a formal system um, we don't have to even be that formal about it but just understanding the idea of a computer or a machine uh, generating a book uh, we can go all the way back to Gulliver's Travels in 1726 of course this is not a computer not a digital computer but it is a machine that is being used to generate a book and uh, we can see it here because um, he included a diagram of it <laughs> so this is a, uh, a part from, uh, I have it up here in the tab, but I might, I might have lost it. Oh, here it is. Okay, great. So this is a, um, an excerpt, well, I've referenced an excerpt from uh, book three of Gulliver's Travels. Um, you're probably familiar with Gulliver's Travels and the, the famous, you know, the island of Lilliput, um, Brobdingnab, um, Quinnum. Uh, it's a, the book is a work of satire. Um, so it describes fantastical voyages and discoveries of Lemuel Gulliver and the, these different strange islands that he goes to. 
And uh, in most cases, those islands are meant to be specific satires of a particular segment of society or uh, life in England or Ireland. And so that's the case here for Laputa as well. Laputa is, I think, a little less well known. Um, but the basic joke or the idea of this particular chapter is that Laputa, I, I, I don't know if that's the conventional way to say it, but Laputa is a, um, it's a flying island. So as you see here, it's a, it's a flying island and there's a city called Legado. And in Legado, uh, the resources of the kingdom are um, overwhelmingly dedicated to arts and sciences. And the, the joke of this chapter or this, this section of this book for, uh, for Jonathan Swift is that these are uh, arts and sciences that have no practical impact on the people in the kingdom. And so the people in the kingdom are suffering and living in poverty because all the resources are dedicated towards uh, these scientific pursuits that actually have no practical purpose and often are ridiculous and don't make any sense and, and, or, or don't work. Um, and so this object that's described here is an example of that. And the... Um, it's interesting. So the, the goal is that this is, you know, it's, it's, it's something that will produce speculative knowledge that basically will produce eventually every possible book in every possible discipline and therefore kind of complete science and art. Um, and the way that it's going to do this is by uh, combining symbols in apparently random until a book is produced and then kind of writing that book down, publishing that, and then uh, moving on to the next one. Um, at the time that this person is visiting, uh, the time that, uh, that Gulliver is visiting, they have not completed a book yet, but they have several volumes of broken sentences uh, that they feel like is, is evidence that they're making progress, but they have not actually completed any, any of these books. Um, and the way it works, so you can kind of see like this, it's a grid of these symbols. These are the symbols in the language of the island. And then um, these things on the outside, these are cranks. So this is a diagram of this machine, how it would work. I guess, and the idea is that these, the, as it says here, um, young students are turning the cranks and arranging the symbols, and every time something makes sense uh, among the symbols that are being arranged, uh, they write it down. And so eventually it's going to get all collected into a book and then presumably published. Um, so the, the joke of this is that this is a waste of time. Like the joke is that this was, um, this is not a good idea and it's, it's kind of a ridiculous idea. Uh, but it is an engine, like it's a machine for generating, for generating books, which is like what I'm talking about today. So it, it to me is definitely a precursor. Um, and also it, it's still, let me, like the joke of it might still be true. Like you might still wonder, like what's the point even in 2021 of writing a computer program that can generate a book? Um, you know, that's debatable. Um, I think it's, I think it's fun. I think there's like, you know, it's enjoyable and it's literature, so it doesn't have to have uh, a use per se, but it's definitely something that, you know, you might, some of the books that are generated by computers, which I'll talk about uh, probably more on Wednesday, are definitely jokes. Like they're definitely meant to be jokes and not practical at all or and not readable at all. But uh, that's all right. So this is the, the Laputian frame. And I think, well, that's what I'm calling it. Um, okay, so another example from early on is uh, from this short story called The Machine Stops, which is a short story by E.M. Forster. This is an early example of science fiction or dystopian science fiction, I guess. And it, it describes a world where humans have created a machine that is so capable of taking care of them that it, that's all it does. And that, that's, the machine takes care of every conceivable need humans have, including um, you know, their, their physical needs as well as their intellectual and emotional needs. And one of the things that it does is produces literature. So there's the hot, so this is describing the point of view of Vashti, who's the kind of the character that you follow for most of the book or the short story. And um, she's got all these buttons that do these different things for her. Uh, it, this book is actually, I mean, the, the short story is actually, I, I, like I often, often assign it in Digital Studies 101 because it's like a good way to think about the different technology that we use and depend on and the buttons we push in our lives to help us kind of think about who we are and live our lives. And a lot of the conveniences that Vashti and the characters in this book experience seem like they're predicting the kinds of things that we use today. Like there's something described here that kind of sounds like a, like a Zoom call, actually. So like that's kind of neat. Um, but there's also this like undercurrent of like meanness, I think, uh, especially towards Vashti. Like it's, she's described as in kind of disgusting like language, kind of grotesque language. Um, it, there's an there's a interesting layer to this short story, I guess. But one of the things that she can do is she can push a button that produces literature. Um, there's also a, a button that produces uh, new musical compositions. 
So these are things that you know, we can think of as being analogous to or predictions of the kinds of things that we can actually do with computers today. Um, as the title suggests in this story, the machine stops, like eventually it stops, uh, it starts breaking down. And one of the things that happens is like the symphonies are not very good and the, the books are not very good. Like, so the quality of the things that it produces starts to break down and other things too, like the food tastes bad and you know, everything else sort of starts falling apart. Then eventually it stops and basically, you know, it's all over. <laughs> so anyway, it's actually a really dark story by the end. Okay, so here's another early example, the nine, million, the nine Billion Names of God. So this is a short story by Arthur C. Clarke, and um, I like the cover of that, the collection that it was included in, so I, I included it there. And this is a short story where there's a group of monks who have, uh, who are committed to the belief that the purpose of mankind is to record all of the names of God, which they have calculated as being uh, nine billion. And they have, they have, they have predicted it'll take them about fifteen thousand years to complete this by hand. But they realize that computers might be helpful in letting them do that as well. This is 1952, so the idea of computers is still like time sharing, serial computing, mainframe kind of things. But uh, this is Arthur C. Clarke's idea that these monks would be, you know, that they recognize that computers can do this kind of thing much faster than we can. So let's get the computer to uh, write these um, these nine billion names for us. That is a hard thing to do, I guess. I mean, it's it's quick for a computer to do it, but would be very time consuming for a human to do it. Uh, the challenge, if you are gonna try to get a computer to do something like this, is having enough memory to do that, like having enough memory to actually do that. But it's, it's conceivable, it's doable. Um, but it actually, you can run out of memory. Like, that's the thing. Like, uh, Nick Montford, who's the author of this book and other things we've seen, um, he's got a short piece that's the, the all the names called All the Names of God. And basically, if you run it on your computer, it'll fill up all of the available memory on your computer and may crash your computer um, because it's trying to print all the names of God, which is um, mathematically you know, impossible eventually because he's, his just keeps going. It doesn't stop at 9 billion. Uh, but this is, yeah, this is the idea. Uh, the idea of your computer crashing, I think, is sort of, it's an echo of what happens in this story where these, these monks, their belief is that once humanity has completed this task of printing or documenting all the names of God, then that's it. Like that's what humanity is for. And so when that is done, then humanity is over or the universe is over. And so at the end of the short, you know, it's a you know, spoiler alert, but at the end of the short story, um, the stars start going out <laughs> and it just kind of ends. It's really ominous, but I, I like it a lot. So there's that one. Um, there's another one actually I don't have a slide for, uh, but Roald Dahl, who you might know from like Charlie and the Chocolate Factory and on a bunch of other kind of creepy kid stuff basically is what I know him from. Uh, he also wrote a short story where there's a computer that can write novels and there's a novelist who is, is kind of depressed about the fact that this computer can write books and so the novelist feels like his job is, he's been replaced by a computer. Um, also 1960s, I think. Um, so fairly early. Um, all right, well, if we're gonna look at actual examples of computer generated books, then um, there are, we can, I think, look at a few candidates. Um, but I, I guess just one last comment about the, the re representation in fiction. Um, I, I just think it's interesting, the idea that computers can handle this, like the idea that that's a thing that people think about computers being able to do. And these are just a few examples. I have more, um, if you know of any more, by the way, if you can think of anything from like a TV show or anything like that, where a computer creates a book um, let me know. I'm trying to keep a track of these and try to kind of build a, you know, an archive of this kind of reference. So let me know. But anyway, like I feel like there was an, a, an episode of the old Star Trek where there was a computer that generated prose of some sort. Um, I know, you know, Commander Data did stuff like that in Next Generation, but I'm thinking there was something in, in the original series, but I haven't been able to, to locate it if, if, that's, if that's true. I, so I could be just making it up. Anyway, so let's uh, move on to some actual examples of computers actually generate, generating books. Um, different candidates, different things you could say to, to make the case for different uh, first examples. Um, but if we're talking about computers in the contemporary sense, so an actual like electronic computer, um, I, think, I think this is probably a good candidate. <laughs> so this is a, a book called A Million Random Digits with 100,000 Normal Deviates. It was published by the Rand Corporation in 1955. Um, and it is exactly what it says. The title tells you everything you need to know about this book, um, other than, I guess, why you would want this book, but it tells you the contents of the book, which is, as it says, a million random digits with 100,000 normal deviates, um, and they're indexed, so you can look them up, look up a random number. 
um, but they're all random. So looking it up, I don't know, that doesn't make sense to look up something that's random because if you look it up, you're telling it it's not right. It has a location. Anyway, the point is that this is a book that was not created as literature or poetry. But if you recall last week when we were talking about kind of working our way towards kinetic poetry, one of the examples I, I showed you kind of that's parallel to concrete poetry is sound poetry, where what matters, the poetics of it is the sound, not the prints, like not, not the meaning of the words, but the sounds that the poet makes as they perform the piece. And there is, I mean, there are examples of sound poetry that are just numbers. Um, and so we've got a bunch of numbers here. We could read them as poetry. Um, you know, we might disagree about the quality of that poetry or, or whether that should get to count as poetry, but, you know, it is at least considered, you know, possible that we could consider this poetry. And so there is a literary context possibly for this book. And so I think it's, a, I think it counts. I mean, I, I'm going to count it. Um, moving ahead a little bit so into the 1970s, this is when we're actually using computers to generate things uh, and, and like computational experiments and this kind of thing. You've got Novel Writer by Sheldon Klein. Um, is a is a computer program written in Fortran that, that produces novels. Another thing often thought of as the first thing to produce uh, to produce um, uh, like a, a, a computer generating stories um, sometimes claimed to be the first. But I think there are earlier examples even of that. Um, I don't have the oh, I forgot to add the slide for it. But um, Grimes is the programmer's name, and he had a fairy tale generator in the nineteen either 1960s or early or late 50s. I don't remember exactly. I need to add that slide, but that's um, uh, Grimes is the name. And that was discovered somewhat recently, so it's not as well known, but it and probably wasn't very influential in the sense that like people didn't know about it, so they weren't like trying to imitate it or improve on it. Uh, but Sheldon Klein's work was widely referenced and cited in 1973. Um, the, the, I guess, and, and yeah, maybe just to go back even a little bit more, um, now that I'm thinking of it, if we're looking for examples of computers like generating text using a you know a computational method, if we think of humans as computers, and that is a, a classification of people, like that was a job that people had, um, there were examples. So Markov, Andre Markov, when he described the concept that we now know as a Markov chain, like he did it like by hand in that paper that he published, um, he did a short section of text that he had generated using a Markov chain, like his, his algorithm. Uh, and that was 1909, I think, off the top of my head. Um, so, and then Claude Shannon also did that in the 1940s. Like he demonstrated the same, an application of Markov's concept in a, in, um, a, a different context, but he did the same thing. He did the calculations by hand and then um, produced some output from it. So uh, that was not published as a book, but it's still in the same ballpark here with the Rand Corporation. Anyway, moving ahead, um, this is an interesting example that I don't think enough people know about. And in fact, I included Carol Spear and Macaulay in the, I, I just added her to the list of women who we should consider making Wikipedia, art, Wikipedia articles about. Um, she does not currently have one, um, but I think she deserves one. Um, she published this book, which is called Happen Thing and Travel On. And it is pretty interesting. I have it somewhere. I have it in one of these tabs. I think this is it. How am I not logged in? Hang on, let me see. I might need to re-log into this. Why did I get logged out? Okay. Um, so this is available in archive.org, and I'm just I'm checking it out here, so I can show it to you. Uh, really? Let's see. Oh yeah, here it is. Okay. So this is um, yeah, happen thing in travel on. It, it's a book that uh, is, like so the term that. Macaulay always used is uh, computer assisted writing. And so she was very clear that this is not like a computer just wrote this off the top of its head, but that she was involved in the process. This is a story that uh, is, is um, explicitly very um, and very deliberately feminist in its ideology. It's a novel um, where you, uh, the, the premise basically is a group of women are on an airplane and then the plane crashes, they survive, but then they are in the woods and they have to survive being in the woods and find their way back out. Um, you can kind of see a map of that here. And the, uh, but there are, are sections of this that are generated by computer and also that are, there are sections that are code. So um, you'll see a bit that, of that in a moment. Um, I just, I wanted to pause on the cover page here, the title page here, because I think the font here is really fascinating. Um, this font that is being used on the title page and on the cover, but like covered up by a sticker on the cover, is a font called Moore Computer. That's M-O-O-R-E 
computer, not like more as in more of a computer, but more uh, someone's name. I've not actually been able to figure out who that was named at, like who more it was, but this is a, uh, it's a computer that you, it, it's a computery looking font. It's a font that you see a lot in the 1970s when you want to associate something with computers and digital technology. It's a very 70s font. Um, the font I believe was created in 1968 if I remember correctly, off the top of my head. Um, and, oh, I forgot to look it up. You know what, I'm gonna look this up real quick. This is, uh, this is off the top of my head, but this is connecting to a chapter from my uh, PhD dissertation. So I'm trying to remember this off the top of my head, but I, I oh, what is it? Oh, that's what it is. Okay, sorry, I just remembered. Okay, so the, uh, the shape of these letters is pretty striking and pretty recognizable. Like, and then what's weird about them, and, and what you probably notice if you look at them, is they've got all these huge ser serifs. Like the A sticks way out here on the left. The H has a similar kind of blob there. N has a whole floating serif in it, basically. And these big blocky slabby things are there uh, not to serve a practical purpose, but to echo a different font called E13B, which did have a practical purpose. Uh, E13B, well, I, almost, I, almost show, I was gonna show you an example, but then I realized that's my, my credit card. I don't wanna put my credit card on this live stream. <laughs> but if you look at credit cards or checks, often you'll see that the numbers are still printed in E13B. And E13B is for magnetic character recognition. So uh, you might be familiar with optical character recognition. Magnetic character rec recognition is a similar concept, except it requires magnetic ink, and then it uses a magnetic reader and this was invented in the 1950s. And so for, you know, at the, at the resolution that those magnetic readers were capable of, they needed the letters to look really, really different from each other. So the designers of E13B came up with this idea of putting all these big blobs in different places strategically. So humans can still tell what number it is, but it looks different enough to the computer that it can I, I, you know, accurately uh, identify what number to record. And so, um, this font that you see here, Happen Thing and Travel On, written in this typeface really, is designed to mimic that look. It's not actually part of the E13B standard. It was created after the fact and do does not actually work, as far as I know, in, in magnetic character recognition, although I haven't looked at that field for a long time. Um, these characters like this thing, uh, these are control characters that are uh, meant to help the machine know what to do with it. Uh, and this was invented for, you know, large scale data processing, batch processing things like, and you'll see like, you'll, you'll see it everywhere once you recognize it. Um, but it's uh, for financial things. It's, so the tracking number on checks, that was the first application of that. And it is still is, is the case that, that checks are written with that ink and with that um, style of lettering on them for the, the, like the routing number and stuff on, on checks. Anyway, um, this actually down here though is interesting because this lowercase is not part of more computer uh, as far as I know. I've never seen a, a lowercase with more computer. It's a similar font, similar looking font here, um, but not the same one for the lowercase letters. Uh, if I'm not, I, I could be wrong about that, honestly, but that's because this is off the top of my head, but that's, uh, that's what I think. Anyway, let me show you some examples of the code generated stuff, the code generating stuff. Um, this is, yeah, so you can see this is a, an example. So this is saying like here it stands a form and then this is kind of defining the form and then creating the different placeholders, a adjective noun, verb, the noun, a gilded bomb share, bomb show, bomb shell, a gilded bomb shelter, air rides, the flaming eggs. So these are, this is how it um, produces this down here. Like this is the, um, like the source code up here and then this is the output down here. And then um, moving into it, then these, like the elements described here, then are what we read about here. So this is kind of giving uh, uh, Macaulay like the template of ref names and references to write for this next section. Um, and it's it's an interesting book. One of the characters, like as I said, it's a group of women who survive a plane crash. They you know have to deal with each other and. Um, survive. One of the characters though is a computer programmer. So I think the idea is that we're kind of hearing from her or like we're, see we're seeing her ideas expressed in computer code um, in 19, you know, 1975, like a really fascinating early example of electronic lit. Um, she did produce other works and this was the only novel uh, as far as I know. She uh, mostly published poetry, but she also published a like handbook explaining how to do this stuff like this. And so uh, this phrase, computer assisted writing is really her, her phrase that she, um, she used to describe these things. And um, I don't know, it's just like a really, it seems like a really interesting person. Um, and 
I would like to know more about here. Yeah, so here you see the, uh, um, the same kind of stanza generator right there. All right, cool. So where's my slideshow? There we are. Um, yeah, Carol Spear and Macaulay. All right, so moving on, uh, this is now in the 1980s. This is the policeman's beard is half constructed by Ractor, uh, which we've seen when we talked about combinatory poetics early on. And it's, uh, you know, it is a well-known example. It is something that is described on the cover as the first computer-generated book. I think I have it up in a tab somewhere here, but maybe not. Um, I don't know. I, I used to have it up in a tab, but it's also, uh, I, I put the PDF in Canvas if you want to look at it, and you did already look at it. But um, if you remember on the cover, there's the tagline, the first computer generated novel or something like that, to that effect, that this is the first novel written by a computer. Um, and I think um, the thing that people ask about this book and that, that people wonder is, is it really <laughs> written by a computer? To what extent? And to what extent was the computer doing things that were then edited by the, the human authors of the book uh, whose names appear on the cover, right? So that relationship between the computer generator, the computer author, and the human author is something that uh, can be, you know, a little murky in some of these works. Um, that's why I really like Carol, Carol Spear and Macaulay's work because it's pretty straightforward. It's like, here's this, you know, here's what it is. Um, but the, uh, in this case, the authors were kind of vague about it, or they uh, maybe intentionally obscured their role in order to make it sound more impressive as a as a work of a computer. I, I don't know. I mean, these are. I, I don't know for sure. I don't have enough evidence to really say. Yeah, you know, to cast aspersions on these authors, but that's, that's that's something that you wonder as you read some of these books that are written by, uh, allegedly written by computers. Um, okay, so here's another really important early example of using computers to, to generate text, and this is a method, not a specific work. But this is a method that gets used over and over again, and it's still used today, and you can, I'll show you how to do it. But this is uh, uh, originally published in 1984 in Byte Magazine, which I have here because I think it's really cool. I like looking at things in their original context whenever I can. And I'll explain the idea, but I just wanted to show you that this is, this is Byte Magazine. So Byte Magazine is pretty technical kind of industry magazine for computer professionals in 1984. Um, not really aimed at consumer, like PC owners, uh, but you know hobbyists might have uh, gotten into it. This is a issue that is dedicated to all the new uh, microchips that came out that year, and so this is like a bunch of microchips, basically, and a bunch of reviews of different integrated circuits. Um, that is what most of this issue is dedicated to. Um, but there is this here too, which is this article by a written by an engineer and a English professor. And what they are proposing here is a method for generating, um, yeah, disconcertingly, as it says here, disconcertingly recognizable text. And what's disconcerting about it is that it actually manages to resemble uh, spe specific authors that you feed into the program. Uh, so they include the full source code of their program in this article. This is um, that, that's the practice at the time that you would just print your, your source code basically as, you know, as text in the magazine. And then if you wanted to use it yourself, if someone else wanted to use it, you'd have to copy it down by hand and then run it in your program. Um, so I did that and you can look at the source code. I put it on GitHub. Uh, it's Pascal. So you can actually still find, like you can compile and run Pascal still on a computer. I did it on my Mac. Um, it's not a common language anymore, but it still works. And uh, it's pretty interesting. But here's what they're doing. So let me zoom in on it because I think, I think their explanation of their method is really good. So uh, language. So finish typing a page of English prose and the key you hit most often will have been the space bar. Either E or T will rank second. You did not make those decisions, the language did. In fact, the language makes three quarters of your writing decisions for you. Not only do the letters observe preferred frequencies, they keep preferred company. A familiar example, write Q, and unless you're drafting a Qantas ad or comments on Iraq, the next character is almost sure to be you. Um, and so what they're doing in their computer program is basically computing those frequencies and companies and then producing a new sample of text that has the same frequencies and preferred companies as the original did, but starting at a random point and then proceeding with those frequencies. And because these are probabilities, not determinations. It's a stochastic text generation method that will produce a different text each time, 
that in some ways sounds like the text it was based on, but is not the same as the text it was based on. So it's considered a travesty because it's like a mockery of the original, you might say that would be a synonym there. But it's a, uh, it's, you know, so that's, um, that's, a, that's what it is. So they're doing it at the letter level here, but you can also do that at the word level. So you could have um, certain words appearing more often after other certain words or in certain contexts. Um, you can compute those contexts using an idea called word vectors. So these are, are things that are, um, are still being done in different forms. And this was a really influential early approach to doing that. Um, hang on a second. I don't have it with me. Always, I like to hold up examples <laughs> when I have them on hand um, because I was going to mention something interesting. The um, maybe it's interesting, I, but the so the, the title of this article and then the program associated with it is called Travesty Generator. Um, and one of the writers who I have included as women who deserve Wikipedia articles is um, Liliana von Ver Bertram, and they wrote an article or they wrote a book of poetry called Travesty generator and a travesty generator is obviously in the creative coding context a pretty clear reference to this program um, and I believe some of the poems in that collection do use a similar method if I'm remembering correctly I can't I'd have to look I need to look at it again um, but um, the other reference built in that is there's a uh, there was a comment uh, so if you go back to the trial of George Zimmerman, who shot, killed Trayvon Martin, um, one of his lawyers afterward referred to the trial and said that the, when, when Zimmerman was found innocent, that the, 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 his lawyer said something to the effect that the uh, jury prevented a tragedy from becoming a travesty. And so that word being associated with that event and the kind of travesty or, you know, uh, uh, travesty of justice or however you want to think of it, um, like that, that word being associated with that event is also part of the, the meaning of that word for uh, Bertram's book um, as they generate poetry that deals with specific events, including uh, Trayvon Martin's um, killing. So these are, uh, it's a way that that work, this work has shown up again in that new context that places it into our contemporary conversation. But again, yeah, Bertram, Lillian von Bertram, uh, that book is excellent and they definitely, I think, should have a Wikipedia page about them. Anyway, so let me move on a bit. That was a bit of a tangent. Uh, and I wish I had the book with me. I could show you what I mean, but I don't have it with me. Uh, okay, so let me move on to another example or two. So this is a book called Just This Once. It's by Scott French and quote, unquote, Hal. Um, this image I thought was just really funny, so um, I wanted to include it here. This, article, this image was included with a New York Times um, article about this book. And it's like, if you can see, it's a, it's a side view of like a Mac 2. Or Mac, you know, he wrote this on a Mac too, I think. Um, but it's the idea of a Macintosh computer, like the one I was emulating on Friday. And uh, but you have some hands reaching through it and then typing, and he's like holding the keyboard here. I think this is so dorky. I like it um, <laughs> with the you know the '90s mullet and everything. Uh, but this is uh, the the book produced here is called Just This Once, and it's meant to be uh, a, like a, um, a a new book by Jacqueline Suzanne, who had died at this point, and so. Uh, it's meant to mimic her style of writing in a way that's that's compelling enough that you can't tell the difference. Um, and he wrote this book with his computer um, using artificial intelligence. He says it's the the code is not available in any way as far as I as I've been able to determine. And even the method he used is like I I don't really understand what he's talking about. So it could just be like you know he wants to keep it close to the vest or perhaps you know and I have to raise this possibility, it, it, it could be the case that like with Ractor and the policeman's beard, um, he's kind of fudging a little bit about how much the computer actually did versus what he actually did. If you read the book, it's straightforward, kind of, you know, cheesy novel. Like it's, it, it reads like a novel. Like it doesn't look like a computer generated novel to me. Like as you read it, uh, it feels very, na it feels just like a, you know, an average novel, average kind of bestseller style of novel. Um, and I don't know. I mean, that's fine if he, if he did, but I just, I, I wish there's a lot, I feel like I want to know more about this and I, I have not been able to determine it. Uh, and as far as I know, I, I haven't really found much at all about or by Scott French since the 90s. So I don't know um, what he's been doing. This is one of the things I'm trying to learn more about as I'm researching this area for my project I'm working on related to these books, computer generated books. 
All right, so moving ahead a little bit, um, Brutus is a computer program, and a, uh, I guess really an AI system um, that's designed to generate stories. Uh, Selmer Bingsjord and David Ferrucci um, produced this book, and it is an example of something that Noah Wardrip Prune called the tailspin effect, where um, it's much more complicated than it appears as far as the prose it produces. The prose it produces is kind of okay, but it's um, much more work behind the scenes and under the hood, so to speak, than would appear to be the case based on the output of it. And you could use much simpler ways to accomplish, to, to write some code that would accomplish things that might read better. And that's, that's the, the trade-off aspect. The tailspin effect is like the inverse of the ELIZA effect. Um, and so the tailspin effect is referencing a different story generator system called tailspin. Um, but this is uh, an example of it. But this is the kind of thing it produces. And I, I include this excerpt. This is a, a sample uh, that brings word published on his website uh, of this story called Betrayal, um, I guess written by Brutus. Dave Atwood loved the university. He loved its ivy-colored clock towers, its ancient and sturdy brick, and its sun-splashed verdant greens and eager youth. Like, that's pretty good prose. Like, I think that's decent. But I think it's interesting that it's this sort of novel about the ivory-covered clock tower of academia, which to me is kind of an echo of Gulliver's critique of intellectualism in uh, the, uh, the, Pu the Putin device um, that I showed you earlier with the, the frame system. So pretty cool. Um, so I wanted to move on. I, I'm almost out of time, so I wanted to make sure I got to this because this is how I, I need to explain your homework. So Nano Genmo is National Novel Generation Month. It's a parody of Nano Rimo or Nano I'm not sure how you say that. Um, I know uh, many of you, I think, are creative writing majors, so you might have done Nano Rimo at some point. Uh, Nano Genmo is like it in that it takes place in November, and the result is a computer pro uh, is a is a book. Um, but in this case, we're writing computer programs that generate books. So Darius Kazemi kicked this off in 2013. With this, uh, hey, who wants to join me in NanoGemo? Spend the month writing code that generates a 50K word novel, share the novel, and code at the end. And, you know, got retweeted a few times, but basically people took him up on it. Uh, the beauty of NanoGemo is that it's actually pretty, like, if, even if you're a novice programmer, it's pretty easy to do something that generates 50,000 words. But getting something to generate 50,000 interesting words or to generate them in an interesting way, that's the real challenge of NanoGemo. And it's, uh, it's very, like, beginner friendly like it's very like the people the community people that participate in it, I think are, are very welcoming and encouraging to new programmers that want to try it out um, but you know, like every year sort of the, the the bar that gets raised or the kind of thing that people talk about are like what what's new in tax generation or, or what new ideas can we put together to come up with this because a lot of things have been done and so how do we innovate and that's why it's so interesting as a, as a community and then as a, an event of, of and then the, the results right the results are really interesting um, this is complete code that would satisfy the requirements. So this would, I came up with this, took me about two minutes to come up with the idea and about 30 seconds to write the code for it. Um, this is a novel called Inside the Beehive. And I say for I in range 50,000, um, print the word buzz. So basically 50,000 times print the word buzz, we're done, right? So we've got a 50,000 word novel there. All of the words are the word buzz, but that's kind of the sound of being inside the beehive, I guess, right? Um, I guess we should make a cicada version of this, <laughs> but that's the idea. That's, that's all you have to do. Um, okay, so let me explain your homework. Um, this is something I'd like for you to complete by Wednesday. Uh, this is a Google Doc that I have shared through Canvas, and I used the collaboration thing in Canvas, so you'll see it under collaborations where the notes Google Docs are. Um, if you get to this document and you don't have access to it or you don't have edit access to it, then request that access through, through the Google Doc if you can, um, but if, or just email me. But if you can do it through the Google Doc, that's quicker for me. So um, please do that if you can. Uh, I just I seeded it with an example of one of my contributions from 2020, uh, just to show you an example of what to do. Um, I would like for these to be unique entries, so try not to duplicate. So if you see someone has already uh, entered something, then try to look for another one. And here's what you do to look for these. I've got links here, um, but so this, uh, let's see. So this is the uh, GitHub page for NanoGemo 2020. The way NanoGemo works is um, it is built on GitHub, and GitHub is a platform, a website that people use to share code. Um, but what we do that's different here for NanoGemo is instead of sharing code, the, the repository is what it's called, is just a placeholder for the event. But then the actual code that people contribute or the ideas that people contribute are shared here as issues. Usually on GitHub, issues are used to file bug reports or request, you know, to, to ask for help about something. Um, but in this case, the issues are being used more like forum posts or threads. And when they are, when they result in a completed book, then 
uh, one of the administrators, usually Hugo, gives you the completed tag and you click on this, you can see all of the completed tags. So there are 56 issues with the completed tag, which means that there are at least 56 books that have been completed this year, which is pretty good. It's not the most, I think if off the top of my head, I think the most ever in one year was like 160, um, but 56 is still pretty decent. I've got the whole numbers on this. I've been doing this uh, information, I, but I don't have, I have not actually documented all of the metadata for this year yet. So you're kind of helping me with this actually. Um, so the idea is look through these the completed issues. Um, let's pick a, let's pick a random one. Uh, 51,300 baby names in Anogema reference book. This is generated by Sabbaths. So here they are. Um, and you can read the book here um, in different versions, PDF or text. And you can look at the source code here, which I don't um, know what that is, but that's all there is to it. This one's not, doesn't have a lot of information, but some of these do have pretty detailed explanations of uh, what someone did. Um, here's one that Nick Montfort did this year. So um, your goal, your homework is to find one of these, just pick one that you think looks interesting and uh, read a little bit about it from the issue thread and read the book if possible, and then write a little bit about it here. Just, so just list the title of the book, the author of it, um, and you can just use their, their username if you um, can't find their actual name, a link to it. So that would be, like the link I have here. And then just a couple sentences. You don't have to go into a lot of depth here and like a, a tweet sized review would be plenty like I've written here for my book. And um, yeah, this is just, I'm providing this as an example. I do really, I was actually really pleased with the result of this one, I, I gotta say, but um, I am kind of just showing you the kinds of things that you can say in your own words about whatever books you find interesting among these, okay. So that's homework. I, sorry, I went a little bit over time, but I wanted to explain that. And you know, if you had to leave, then you know, this will be archived in the usual places. So um, that's it for class. So, so if you're um, a student and you're trying to figure out how to do this homework, uh, let me know. But it, I, I hope it's explained well enough in the uh, assignment page in Canvas and also in the document itself. Um, but um, if you have any questions, of course, please let me know. Okay, well, I will wrap up the stream. There are some birds hanging out of the feeder, even though I don't have the camera positioned very well to see them. Uh, they're coming and going. So I'll, I'll switch to the camera, the bird cam for a few minutes and wish you all a good day. I um, hope you all are doing well. It looks like the rain is stopping finally, so I'll probably go take a walk after this. Um, but yeah, I will see the odd cohort in person on Wednesday and then everyone else I will see on Zoom and then even cohort next week. All right, so let me, so I'll switch to the bird cam. So let me turn on some music and I will see you all later. <laughs>